In this webcast, we're going to look in detail at patterns of electron flow and substitution reactions specifically. You're probably already familiar with the nucleophilic substitution paradigm, which involves the SN2 and SN1 reactions. In this webcast, I'm going to introduce the SE, or electrophilic substitution paradigm as well, and show you some examples of that that you've already seen that you may or may not have thought of as substitution reactions in the past. So substitution reactions, as we've seen, involve the general replacement of a group X on a carbon center, typically. Typically R is a carbon group, with a reagent Y. And so the result is the expulsion of X and the replacement of X with the group Y on R. There are two ways that we can basically think about this happening. The first is what we might call what you're used to, and that's nucleophilic substitution. Nucleophilic substitution involves the reagent Y as a nucleophile, and that means that Rx is an electrophile. To give you a classic example of this, if we were to take an amid base, such as NH2- and add it together with methyl bromide, we would end up with a methylamine as the final product. The mechanism here involves SN2 displacement of the amide for the bromide. And so the mechanism here is simply the SN2 elementary step. And this label, the SN, refers to the fact that the reagent is a nucleophile. That's the source of the letter N there. Another possibility for nucleophilic substitution involves weak nucleophiles. A common paradigm here is acidic conditions where the leaving group is activated by the acid. So for example, if we ran the reaction in solvent methanol and we took tert butyl alcohol and treated that with acid, what could happen under these conditions is protonation of the oxygen which creates a good leaving group, followed by DN, or nucleophile dissociation, to produce a tert-butyl cation, which is then attacked by the solvent, methanol. And that leads ultimately to a substituted product, where OME has substituted for OH. The sequence of elementary steps here is proton transfer followed by D sub N, dissociation of the nucleophile, A sub N, association of the new nucleophile, comes next, and then a final proton transfer, which I haven't shown, regenerates a neutral product. So this is a second common sequence of elementary steps that we see for substitution, and it basically corresponds to, we can think of, the SN1 mechanism. So SN1 is a multi-step mechanism, but the way it takes place is through this sequence of elementary steps. That's nucleophilic substitution. Notice that in both cases, the methanol and the amide base are nucleophiles, one much stronger than the other, but in both cases, the organic compound really involved here, which is the methyl bromide or the tert butyl alcohol, those are electrophiles. This is nucleophilic substitution because that reagent Y is a nucleophile. What about electrophilic substitution? What would that look like? Consider that for a second. What would electrophilic substitution look like? How can substitution take place when the reagent is an electrophile? Well, I'll give you a good example of this in a second. Just very quickly to bring some notation into this, these mechanisms are typically called S sub E because the reagent involved is an electrophile, and we think of carbon as the nucleophile here. So whereas carbon was an electrophile in the previous cases, carbon is a nucleophile in electrophilic substitution mechanisms. One of the most common ways for this to proceed is through an A sub E followed by D sub E sequence. And although the labels may seem mysterious, the context in which this mechanism occurs is probably familiar to you, and it's the Friedel-Crafts reaction. So for example, if we were to take benzene, and treat it with conditions that produce the tert butyl cation. So we won't worry about the mechanism for how this cation was produced, but what happens in this mechanism is association of the pi bond with the cation, right? And this is a classic A sub E elementary step. At this point, we're left with a cation 
and we've formed a bond between the tart butyl group and the aromatic ring. What can occur at this point is recreation of aromaticity through loss of the proton. And usually there's a conjugate base hanging around to remove that proton, but we can think of this as a DE step, dissociation of electrophile. Specifically, the electrophile here is the proton, H+. And notice how the overall reaction here corresponds to a substitution. So we've taken a reagent Y, the tert-butyl cation, which is an electrophile, and placed it at a position where H plus was before. This is electrophilic substitution. Electrophilic substitution is common under acidic conditions when strong electrophiles are hanging around and weak nucleophiles, weak carbon-based nucleophiles, can react with those electrophiles. There's another way to think about electrophilic substitution under strongly basic conditions. And the idea here is to think of the reagent as a weak electrophile and the carbon-based reactant as a strong nucleophile. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. And you may think to yourself initially that it looks a lot like nucleophilic substitution, so we'll soon see that there's some ambiguity here. But consider a possible mechanistic sequence where there's a proton transfer first followed by SN2. So for example, say we took something that had two electron withdrawing groups. Think of ours as carbonyl groups or uh, nitrile groups, your favorite withdrawing group. And we treated that with base. And the base removed one of the protons associated with the central carbon atom to yield a carbanion. Now the carbanion is an awesome nucleophile in and of itself. But imagine we treated this with Br2, the reagent Br2, and the step that followed was an SN2 step, where the carbanion displaces bromide, leading to the formation of a new carbon-bromine bond. Technically speaking, this is an electrophilic substitution because the reagent used to affect the substitution is an electrophile, right? The Br2 is an electrophile here. It looks a lot like nucleophilic substitution, and from the perspective of the bromine atom, for example, it kind of is a nucleophilic substitution. So we see in this example in particular a kind of ambiguity that results when we try to distinguish between electrophilic and nucleophilic substitution. And this is particularly common when we talk about C-C bond formation, carbon-carbon bond formation. When carbon-carbon bonds are formed through substitution reactions, what has to happen is one carbon has to take up the role of nucleophile and one has to take up the role of electrophile. So depending on our perspective, we can think of the reaction as a nucleophilic or electrophilic substitution. And I want to show you an example of that. So imagine again, we took an amide base one more time. I'll use just NR2 here in this example. And we treated it with a ketone such that we formed an enolate anion. And after forming this enolate, imagine that we dumped in, along with it, some methyl bromide. The step that followed would be SN2 to produce the final product, which has a new carbon-carbon bond. And this is technically, from the perspective of the enolate carbon, from the perspective of that carbon, this is an electrophilic substitution. The reagent that the enolate was treated with was an electrophile. But of course, from the perspective of the methyl carbon of methyl bromide, this is a nucleophilic substitution. To sum up, let's quickly review the common sequences of elementary steps that we see in substitutions. So there's the SN2 mechanism, which can occur just directly in a single step. We have the SN1 mechanism, which usually occurs through some kind of proton transfer, followed by DN and AN, those are the critical steps, and then a final proton transfer, typically. Under the electrophilic substitution, or SE paradigm, we have the Friedel-Crafts type, so-called SE1 reactions, where we have an AE followed by a DE. Notice how the notation parallels the SN1 reaction, it's just that we've replaced N with E. This is one of the powerful aspects of the notation. We also have the electrophilic substitution under technically basic conditions, where deprotonation at carbon occurs first and an electrophilic reagent comes in to actually affect the substitution. And we've seen how there's some ambiguity here, particularly in the context of CC bond formation, when we talk about this PT followed by SN2 sequence. But it's a very common paradigm for substitution that you'll see 
again and again in organic reactions.